in our hearts and minds, that you would challenge us and comfort us, and remind us that even though sometimes we may feel like the choir, we may feel like the church that is getting it right, that we too still have things to learn. Move around us, between us, through us, in the midst of us, because of us, and despite us. In your many good names we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, hello everyone. Hello. It's so good to see you. I arrived here this morning and realized I know like four of you already. <laughs> so I'm feeling really great. And I also love being a guest preacher because that means I can say whatever I want. And as long as you don't have anything to throw at me, I get to leave. And uh, Gloria gets to deal with the things. <laughs> so thanks, Gloria. But this weekend, we are joining together with faith communities all across the nation to highlight children's issues and to take action collectively to solve the problems that children face. The theme this year for Children's Sabbath is Uniting Hearts and Voices to End Child Poverty. So we focus our worship today on the plight of impoverished children and our responsibility to love them support them, and change the very systems that continue to harm them. The Children's Defense Fund, you may have heard of the Defense Fund, they sponsor the Children's Sabbath, and they put together an entire policy proposal that outlines how we can shift our national priorities to end child poverty. I suggest you check it out. I printed out the entire policy. I gave it to Gloria. Um, you all are going to read it together and figure out what you're going to do. I just made that up. I don't know if you're going to do that or not. Um, but maybe you can. I don't know. But in reality, it's really easy to be overwhelmed by the many, many, many ways that children suffer. Whether it's here in Oak Park or halfway around the globe. It's so overwhelming and oppression is so pervasive that we've really become desensitized. The news cycle shows us a different tragedy every single day. When 20 children were executed at Sandy Hook, we thought things would surely change. But we're still here crying, how long, Lord, how long? When George Zimmerman murdered Trayvon Martin, we thought things would surely change, but we're still here crying, how long, Lord, how long? When we learned that over 16,000 Chicago public school students experienced homelessness last school year, we thought things would surely change, but we're still here crying, how long, Lord, how long? Today, we know that three, only three, of the richest men in America hold more of our nation's wealth than the bottom half of our population. Three men have more money than 160 million of us. We know that the highest paid American CEO took home over $103 million in 2017, and that's more than the combined average annual salaries 4,360 child care workers, or 1,805 elementary school teachers. That makes it sound like to me that as a country, we surely don't care much about our children. So what can we possibly do to alleviate poverty for the nearly 13 million children who suffer the consequences of being poor here in the richest country? in the world. How long, Lord? How long must we sing this song? How long? Our scripture today, which we've already got a wonderful rendition of, is a parable from Luke 18. And it pops up in the midst of Jesus' final journey to Jerusalem. He's journeying there. He knows what's about to happen. He's trying to tell his disciples and other people. And like most times, they don't really get it. And it addresses the disciples' longing for vindication and their seemingly unfulfilled hope for the coming kingdom of God. They keep like wondering, like, Jesus, when is this going to happen? 
The disciples have been crying to Jesus, How long, Lord? And this parable about the persistent woman is one way that Jesus responds to them. It's a parable that speaks also to the original readers of Luke's Gospel, those who were suffering under the weight of violent government. They would, like the disciples, be asking, how long, how long do we have to wait? How long must we trouble? How long must we pray, God, for you to end our suffering? How long must we wither under the sword of empire and greed? How long, God, until you come and fix this mess? How long do you save our children? How long? So Jesus said this parable to his disciples. So I'm wondering what this parable can say to us today as we acknowledge the horrible conditions that our youth have to endure as we dream and ponder ways to enact God's dream or God's kingdom here on earth. Now this parable of this persistent woman and the unjust judge, I think he was just a jerk, so I, you know, we were talking like, is that, yeah, I think he's just rude. Like all parables, it has many layers, many meanings, and many interpretations, and I love parables, they're really my favorite, because they are the stories that Jesus utilized to deconstruct and reverse what his listeners assumed about the kingdom of God. Parables break in and start to shake around what we believe are normal ideas. Now, we kind of often sanitize them into these moralistic stories, but they're really not that, and they weren't meant to be that. Parables are the stories that shatter our deep structures of acceptance. They remove our defenses and make us vulnerable to the Spirit of God. So I hope we can get vulnerable together today. Parables open up room for transformation and for new life. So I'm hoping this parable can open up new life for us today. This parable is about prayer, it's about justice, it's about who God is and who we should be. It's a bit different than some others because as we heard, the very first sentence Either the writer of Luke or somebody later, perhaps a scribe, inserted a description right at the beginning that says, like, hey, this is what the whole parable is about. That's not really typical for a lot of parables. But the verse says, this is a parable about the need to pray always and not to lose heart. So sometimes I like to think, well, I could just say that and then say amen and we can all eat donuts together because I hear you do that here. <laughs> I haven't had any yet. Wink, wink. I don't know what I have to do to get one, but, but I'm not going to do that. I'm going to keep going. Because it turns out there's more in the parable than just that. The, the imperative in that first phrase, though, to pray always and to not lose heart, matched with the very last sentence of the parable, which suggests that Jesus might not find any faithful people on earth, it speaks to the context of first century Palestine, and I believe it speaks to the context of 21st century America. Because the imperative to keep praying and keep the faith can seem nearly impossible in the midst of such oppression and harm and sorrow. There are mothers and fathers and parents that pray unceasingly for the safety of their children, but then have to bury their children in graves because of gun violence and police brutality and lack of health care and religiously fueled bigotry. How can we believe that God will grant justice to the ones who cry out day and night when we look around and see so many unfulfilled prayers for justice and equity and transformation? How can we hold on to hope in times such as these. Why should we believe that God will step in and fix it for our children? I believe that the persistent widow in our parable today gives us a glimpse of what Jesus means by praying always and not losing heart. 
We don't simply pray because we think God will answer all of our prayers. We pray with our thoughts and our voices and our feet because that's how we participate in the kingdom of God. The kingdom that is inbreaking already here and not, read yet, not yet here fully. We keep the faith not because we are sure that things will get better, because, but because we long for things to get better. Because we hope what they hope beyond hope, a hope without control, that things will get better. We lean into God's promises of peace and restoration and justice. We lean in with our full, whole selves, becoming co-creators with God, co-creators of the kingdom here on earth. And if we follow the lead of the persistent widow, we keep on showing up in obnoxious and inappropriate ways, to demand justice for ourselves and for others. The widow shows us that sometimes, and I would say most times, it does require insolent, obnoxious, intolerable, and even socially unacceptable behavior to move those in power to act in just ways. The powerful judge literally had no desire, none whatsoever, to act justly or morally. He didn't care about the widow, and it seems like the text tells us he didn't care about anyone. It seems like the judge, like many in power today, only cared about keeping his position of power. Power is a mighty drug. And the judge didn't have some sort of change of conscience. His heart was not transformed. He wasn't convinced by civil dialogue or an exchange of ideas. He didn't grant the widow justice because she asked nicely. The immoral, powerful judge granted justice because he was so annoyed with the widow that he moved in a just way simply to shut her up. In the text, we see that the judge says to himself, Though I have no fear of God and no respect for anyone, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will grant her justice, so that she may not wear me out by continually coming. The phrase in our text that is translated to wear me out is actually more literally, literally translated from the Greek to give me a black eye. I found this really interesting. <laughs> so the judge says, I will grant her justice, so that she may not give me a black eye by continually coming. The judge is worried that the woman will give him a black eye. He might be literal. Maybe he's afraid that the advocating widow will strike him physically. But it's more likely that the, he believes that she will tarnish his reputation by becoming a visible nuisance. A black eye on who he is as a judge. The judge had no desire to act justly, but his hand was forced by an underserved, socially powerless woman who acted inappropriately. She didn't follow the rules or norms of her society. She rejected decorum and civility. Amen. And this story speaks to me on such a very deep level. Before moving to Chicago, I was doing faith rooted organizing in Charlottesville, Virginia, where we were under the constant threat of white supremacist violence. We weathered the incredibly violent Unite the Right rally, where we were harmed physically, emotionally, and mentally, where a woman was killed, and many of my friends spent many, many days in the hospital from being run over by a white supremacist with a car. One month before the catastrophic Unite the Right rally, we resisted a literal KKK rally, <coughs> at which the militarized police escorted the robe and hood wearing KKK into our park, escorted them back to their cars, and then threw chemical gas at us, the peaceful counter-protesters who were gathered to demand the Black Lives Matter. In the past several years in Charlottesville, I've been told over and over and over again, and it's been mostly by well-meaning white Christians, 
that my faith-rooted and nonviolent activism has been uncivil. I've been told that I've perpetuated violence by showing up to resist literal Nazis. I've stood next to my friends as they've been thrown to the ground by brutal police, barely escaping that same fate myself. I've been told over and over and over again that being angry about horrible injustice and crying out loudly in the streets will get us nowhere. I've been told that we should all just try to be a little bit nicer and realize that it's okay to disagree. I've been told that I should try harder to love the racist, misogynistic, and queer-hating neo-Confederates. I actually received an email, I was just going through some emails lately of that summer of 2017, I received an email from a pastor that said, I'm not sure I'm gonna show up to the protest today. And it's not because I'm worried about the violence of the white supremacists, I'm not worried about that, I'm worried that we're gonna do violence by being there. So when people who stay on the sidelines or stay safe inside their churches decide to lecture me, about the need for civil discourse. I turn to this quote by James Baldwin. He said, we can disagree and still love each other unless your disagreement is rooted in my oppression and denial of my humanity and right to exist. The widow in our parable and James Baldwin and every oppressed person in the history of the world knows that people who wield power over others never, ever, ever give it up through civil discourse. People in power do not relinquish power because you ask nicely. Every radical movement of the world was labeled in its own time as uncivil, as inappropriate, as obnoxious, and as violent. Jesus was labeled as an insurrectionary threat to the empire, so those in power nailed him to a cross. The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King was labeled as a communist and a threat to American ideals, so the FBI worked to make his life miserable until he was executed by a white supremacist. Nonviolent activists in Charlottesville and Ferguson and Baltimore and Chicago have been monitored and violently arrested over and over again. <clears throat> Police in Charlottesville have arrested more nonviolent anti racist and anti fascist activists than they have actual white supremacists and neo Nazis. I have become convinced that in America, in white America, in Christian America, we will choose to be surrounded by well-mannered racists or bigots instead of being surrounded by loud and rowdy advocates for justice. And that's because as a nation, we worship civility. We worship the status quo. We worship our systems of governing the systems that continue to exploit the people that Jesus called the least of these. And I wonder, as we envision this parable about the obnoxiously persistent widow and the unjust judge, if we imagine ourselves supporting the widow and her inappropriateness, or if we can more easily imagine ourselves as the judge, becoming fed up with our inability to go about our business as usual and doling out charity so that our reputation will not be tarnished. Are we willing to be obnoxiously persistent in our work for justice? Are we willing to support those who cry loudly in the streets and maybe throw some curse words around? If I had a dime, for every time somebody in Charlottesville said, I'm not showing up because people have said F white supremacy, then I would have like 10 whole dollars. That's what, like, seriously, so many of my conversations in Charlottesville were with church people who wouldn't come to a protest because activists had signs that said F white supremacy. F white supremacy. <laughs> Are we willing to have others label us as inappropriate? Are we willing to disrupt business as usual for the sake of justice and goodness and life? Are we willing to risk our power, our wealth, 
our reputations for the sake of the nearly 13 million children who were crushed under the weight of forced poverty. Or as Jesus said, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? In times such as these, friends, how do we keep the faith? How do we hold on to hope? How do we pray consistently and not lose heart? Hear this good news. God has promised that we are never alone. God is with us. We are with each other. The Holy Spirit moves between us, around us, through us, because of us, and despite us. The Spirit of God, which is the Spirit of community, and the Spirit of hope beyond hope, and the Spirit of obnoxious justice. It moves in our midst and will continue to encourage us, embolden us, strengthen us, and challenge us to be co-creators with God. That is our call. We are called to be co-creators in making this world, this country, this neighborhood of Oak Park, a safe and healthy and thriving place for all children, even when it makes us feel a little bit uncomfortable about ourselves. The Children's Defense Fund says that we can end child poverty if we pray. We pray as we write letters to elected officials calling for just policies that acknowledge the limits of our current system. We pray as we listen to and believe people of color when they tell us that things are not equitable. We pray as we hold the hand of a child we are mentoring, or hammer a nail to repair a low-income home, or hint, hint, volunteer at the night ministry. <laughs> that was a shameless plug. I'm not, I'm not ashamed. We pray as we write members to our members of Congress to support policy improvements that would cut down child poverty. We actually can do that if we stop funding other things like war. We pray as we disrupt business as usual to demand that children get a proper education, which is happening all over the city of Chicago right now. We pray as we gather with those who stand outside the systems of institutional power and we knock knock, knock on the walls of power until they let us in or until those walls come tumbling down. So let's keep showing up, friends, time after time, demanding justice and demanding it now. Let's get obnoxious. Let's get creative. Let's challenge the ideals of appropriateness and civility. And let's do it because we are called by God to follow the radically subversive way of Jesus so that 13 million children may thrive. Amen. Amen.
conscious. Amen. Amen. Amen.